Thanks, Rolf. Morning, ladies and gents, as Rolf said. Uh, my name is Simon Brown, uh, not a stockbroker, not a financial advisor, just a trader, investor, and uh, a teacher, I suppose, more than anything else. My remit this morning was to talk about investing, and I'm going to touch on, on, on a couple of concepts. Some uh, Sean has gone through, so obviously those we will flip more quicker through, um, and then ideas around portfolio constructions and the like, and I'll touch on that because there are folks who are coming later this morning who will delve into it in a, in a lot more detail, which do for works there. Um, obviously, it's roles and like, and a lot of this is what Sean went through, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. Um, I want to touch on the stockbroker part. And it'd be mentioned by Rolf, it's been mentioned by Sean as well from PSG, is that you do need to have a stockbroker. You cannot go direct in the sense that you engage the JSC. You have a stockbroker who then gives you access to the JSC. And the question you need to ask yourself is, what are you looking for from your broker? Uh, is it about price? Is it about uh, the research reports that they, that they offer out? Is it about their educational offering? Uh, the online platform? Um, perhaps you don't want online and you want good old-fashioned telephone. And it really is a, a part of you know, having started a club is to say, well, what are we looking for? What are the things that are important in our environment? And then which stockbroker meets those requirements? And the short answer is shop around. Find that broker that does meet them. Engage with the brokers. Find those that, that, that have the offering that, that meet your requirement. A lot of them will, will do research reports. But are they issuing reports that, that, that are what you're looking for? What about the, the data that they've got within it? You know, the historic data, price data, and fundamental data. So typically, when we look at a broker, we think it's price. Uh, and, you know, we think it's all about the cheapest and nothing else really matters. And Yeah, price is important. But there's a bunch else out there I think we need to delve into as well around that broader offering in the process. And that's critically important. The website, the jc.coza website, obviously covers a large amount. Of, it gives lists where the brokers are available. Uh, and in essence, you can start interviewing them and finding those that meet that requirement. Uh, Sean touched on this briefly, and I want to delve it into, into a little bit more, which is a strategy. I mean, the key of your strategy, of course, is create wealth. Uh, ultimately, and it's not about uh, the, the, the shares you're going to sell, it's about that, that dividend flow, that cash flow that you're going to get from it. And that's obviously the purpose. But within that creating wealth, you know, what sort of timelines are you looking for? What sort of risk are you looking for? You know, we're all in a hurry to get rich. We'd like to be rich by, I don't know, next weekend. <laughs> uh, in fact, I'm thinking maybe Friday morning so I could have lunch on Friday. Or, you know. Truth of the matter is, there's one way we get rich quick. Yeah, now everyone's paying attention. <laughs> One way we get rich quick, marry money. Yeah, I know. All the married people are going, eh, <laughs> <laughs> Investing is a process. But within that, I mean, it's not just, okay, so you know, what sort of timelines have, have we got? It, you know, how risky? Typically, the view that we take is that when we're young, we can take more risk. And I get the point of that. You know, if you're 22 and you lose everything, no disrespect, it probably wasn't very much, and you're 22, you can get it again. If you're 72 and you lose everything, yeah, you better know where your kids live because they're your future. <laughs> but there's a further point to that. I say, yes, at 22, you can, take, you can take some risk, but at 22, you have one of the most important assets in abundance, time. The more time you have, the easier it is. Sean was talking about Warren Buffett. I think he's the third richest man in the world. At times, he's been the richest. Uh, anywhere in the top 100 would be fine for me, but... <laughs> he's also 81 years old, and he started when he was 11. Yeah, I know. We're all thinking 11. I, mean, I, I don't know what I was doing at 11, but I wasn't buying shares. But I mean, that's just it. 70 years. Now, we don't need to be as rich or as spectacularly famous as Warren Buffett, but we need to understand that it is a process. And then even when you're younger, just buying the boring quality stuff and coming back many, many, many years later is going to create serious wealth. We don't need to do that level of, of high risk, trying to get rich in a hurry, because the short answer is, if we could, we would all be rich by now. So it's about that strategy. Yeah, and are you going to be doing, and I'm going to touch on it in a bit more detail, focusing on income. Perhaps you want growth. Perhaps it's about momentum. Uh, perhaps it's small and mid-caps and the like. And we'll delve into that into more detail. But it's, it, it's critical that you understand that style of investing that you're going to do. And it doesn't have to be one or the other. 
I, I invest uh, sort of, I do a lot of momentum investing. I do some quasi-value investing. I'm not quite the Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett uh, level of discipline, but I do quasi-value investing where I buy quality when it's cheap. And we can talk in a bit around how do we find quality and how do we define cheap. Um, and, and blue chip. And I'm particularly, you know, to my mind, the, the, the blue chip stocks are the ones I most, most like. And what's a blue chip? A blue chip classic definition is share that's got you know, 10 years of uninterrupted profit growth, 10 years of dividend payment. Uh, a company that's got a, a, a product that I say that is absolutely indispensable to us. And obvious examples is banking. Everyone in this room has a bank account. In fact, in truth, we probably have many bank accounts. You've got a, maybe a, a current account, hopefully a savings account, maybe vehicle finance, maybe an a, a unsecured loan, maybe a home loan, maybe a broker account. We're up to six already and we could carry on counting. And as much as none of us appreciate the fees we pay, as much as none of us love our banks, the banks like to pretend we do, but in truth we don't. <laughs> the reality is we're going to have those bank accounts until the day we die. Banks are going to outlive us, and they, they make money easily. Those are the sort of blue chips. Other blue chips, food. Not food growing. Food growing is may, way hot. I mean, it doesn't rain, or it rains too much, or, or the bugs come, or there's too much risk in the growing of food, but the retailing of food, because you know what? We all eat, and we're going to continue eating, and, and then you go and find, well, okay, so food's interesting, and you go and find the winners, and I want to stress this point, and I'm going to come back to it again and again and again. You want to buy the winners. Don't go look at the losers and say, well, that loser might become the winner, because it might. But you know what? Half-time Brazil, Germany, 5-0 to Germany. You were, frankly, a fool if you went and put money on Brazil. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. Brazil might have won. Yes, Brazil might have won. It might snow tomorrow morning in the streets of Joburg. It's not impossible. It is deeply, deeply, deeply unlikely. <laughs> the winners tend to carry on winning. You know why? Because A, they know how to experts at it but also they use their size and they use their winning nature to continue to win and in a sense to bully the competitors shop right and pick and pay shop right is the out and out winner do you think shop right's going to stand back and let pick and pay take over the turf no they're going to use every inch of their influence their ability their power their persuasion to grind shop right into an even smaller business so pick and pay and is it I mean, could Pick and pay one day be the, the best retailer in the country again. They were once. ShopRite overtook them. It can happen. Of course it can. But the winner right now is ShopRite. And you want to be with the winning stocks. You want to be invested with the winners. They tend to carry on winning. And at times they will stumble and fall and then we need to change track. But until they stumble, until they fall, while they're the out and out winners, we stick with them. And we stay with them as long as possible. And we go and find those boring blue chips. We go and find those companies in dominant sectors that dominate their spaces. The companies that have got the track records. The new up and comings maybe one day will become the blue chips. But it's really tough to get to that space. I mean, let's stick with food rate retailing. How many listed food retailers have we got? Four. Spa, Mass Mart, Pick and Pay, ShopRite. Ah, Woolies, five. How can I forget Woolies, my favorite? <laughs> I'll touch on Woolies in a moment. So we've got five listed. But over the last 50 years in South Africa, how many supermarkets do you think have started? Hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands? You know, it's corner shops. I mean, we're not even talking the spas of stores. We're talking you know, thousands and thousands and thousands. Yet five rise to the top. The others, many will fail, probably the majority. A bunch will plot along and not do very much. Five of them get to the top. I quickly want to touch Willys and, uh, and ShopRite. And again, just to understand the distinctions between companies. Because you look at food retail and you say, well, food retail is food retail. Well, no, pick and pay do it incredibly badly. ShopRite do it incredibly well. So do Willys. But Willys do it completely differently. What do they do? They take a lovely piece of steak, they wrap it in four pieces of plastic, and they charge you a large amount of money for it. <laughs> you know what? We pay that large amount of money. Yes. 
It's the, it's the brand awareness. It's the, the status almost to a point. You, know, you want people to know. My housekeeper takes Woolies packets, shops at Pick and Pay, puts her Pick and Pay food in the Woolies packet, <laughs> and then she walks the long way home so that everyone can see her with her Woolies packet. In my household, we just do it different. I shop Woolies, my wife shops at ShopRite. We need a nice di division of labor there. Well, because we own both shares. So if you're going to own both, you've got to support both. <laughs> Can someone come along and be better than Woolies in terms of the, the status? They can try. Is it going to be easy? No. No. So that's their defensive. Warren Buffett calls it a moat. That thing around the business that stops the competitors attacking you. Shop right, location, and price. You can actually fight location and price. Not easy, but you can. Woolies, status. I paid a stupidly large amount for this piece of steak. I got ripped off. Somehow that gives me status. <laughs> Point is, it makes Woolies money. So hey, don't argue the logic. <clears throat> Exiting. And in fact, Sean stole my thunder there, but he makes a brilliant point. When is the best time to sell a share? Never. If you buy the right share at the right price, your sale is never. The oaks who really benefit are your heirs when you pass away. When you're selling a share, it's because something went wrong. Something went wrong with your selection process. Something went wrong with your purchase, pr with your purchase price. Or something went wrong with the business itself. Warren Buffett says, you buy a share, you've got to be happy that the stock market closes for a decade and you can't sell it. The ideal holding period, forever. And in my long-term portfolio, and I call it my death to us part portfolio, because I hold those shares until I die or they die. In 22 years, I have sold shares three times. Once was a mistake, my mistake. Twice was the right deal. Sold pick and pay, sold Nedbank. When Nedbank lost their way and when pick and pay lost their way. And I was selling them because something was wrong in the process. I buy them hoping with the intention that I've bought the right company and that it will continue to be the one you want to hold forever and a day. And then in terms of, of the valuations, and I'm not going to delve into this because we've got speakers later this morning talking both on fundamental and technical. Fundamentals is looking at the data, looking at, at the <coughs> excuse me, uh, balance sheets and cash flow statements and income statements. And on the surface, that stuff all seems crazily complicated and immensely difficult. It's not. None of this is rocket science. There's a lot to learn. I get that. There, there's a lot to learn. And there's a lot of jargon out there, a lot of fancy words that we use. But it's not rocket science. And we can learn balance sheets. I, I don't have an account. My background is film and video. We can learn a, what a balance sheet is and a cash flow statement. We can learn to understand income statements and earnings per share and dividends and those sort of things. No rocket science required. The other side is technical, which is looking at the chart. And typically, you'll find that the investor is more fundamental focused and the trader is more technical focused. And many times, if you get a technical analyst and a fundamental analyst in a room, they can argue more than a Chelsea and a Liverpool supporter, or maybe Pete's, uh, Chiefs and Pirates. <laughs> but the Chiefs and, Chiefs and Pirates is easy, because only one of those is a good team, and I'm not going to say which one. <laughs> <laughs> not going anywhere near that debate. And in truth, it's just that. It's just a debate. At the end of the day, it's personal preference. It's absolutely about personal preference. Or a blend of. Why does it have to be either or? Yeah. My, 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 my nephew's six. He's trying to support a soccer team. He's trying to decide which one. And he says to me, but can I like both? <laughs> I'm like, yes, sis, dude. I don't know about that. But, I mean, <laughs> but why not? Why can't he like both? You know what? He'll never be disappointed on Derby Day. <laughs> <laughs> so strategy. We're talking long term. And we're saying long term, we're talking decades. We're not talking Friday. Some people say long term. Yeah, okay, long term must be October. No, no, long term, 2030, forget the 20s, 2030, we're talking decades. Stock market creates wealth, but you've got to give it that time to create the wealth. And speaking of time, uh, I think I'm doing good for time. So you've got to give it loads. 
It's about what it's that capital growth. And the point with that capital growth is that as your capital grows bigger and bigger, so your dividend, your cash flows that you receive from the companies grows at the same time. And initially, the first dividend check, I remember the first dividend check I ever received. It was 23 cents. It was a long time ago. Back in those days, you could buy stuff with 23 cents. Not much, but you could buy. In fact, I think you could buy a liter of milk for 23 cents. Anyway, it was 23 cents. It was, it was nothing. But that same share, now you're getting dividends on an annual basis which are equal to more than what you paid for them. And I'll give you one example. And I'm going but way, way, way back. And I'm giving you this particular example because I was looking at the numbers just yesterday. Standard Bank, you could have bought the share in 1990 for around 3 Rand per share. Last year, you got 4 Rand 50 in dividends. You're getting one and a half times in dividend what you paid for the share. The secret which you all spotted, 24 years. Didn't happen overnight. Absolutely never happens overnight. Uh, you, you need a benchmark. I'm going to come back to that. Dividends are critically important. We all ignore them. So a company makes a profit, and what do they do with their profit? Well, they keep some of it within the business to grow the business, to compete, to knock out the competition, to, to expand into new markets and new geographies and perhaps new product lines. And then they take some of that profit and they say, well, let's give, it to the, let's give some of this profit back to the owners of the business, the shareholders, me and you. And they give that to us in form of dividend, cash. Typically, they will do it once or maybe twice a year. They do it at the end of their financial year. Some of them will do it in mid-year at the same time. And I call that free money. You know what the beauty is? You buy a share today. You are entitled to the dividends on that share for the rest of of your life, or the, in fact, the rest of the company's life, as long as you hold the share. So I've got a share in my portfolio that I bought in 1992, and every six months they give me free money. I bought it 22 years ago, and I'm still getting the free money every single six months. And I will continue until I sell the share, and in truth, if I don't sell it when I die, I leave the share to my undecided nephew, <laughs> and he gets the dividends forever and a day. As long as the company continues to make profit, as long as the company continues to exist, and as long as I, or my nephew, continue to hold the company. And we look at the dividends, and we look at that first dividend check, and you invest a thousand rand, and you get a dividend out, and it's, what are you gonna get in a thousand rand? You're gonna get 25 bucks. That might buy you two liters of milk at the local spaza. Won't buy you two liters of milk at Woolies. No, no. <coughs> And you think 25 rand. But you know what? You do nothing. You put the 25 rand in your portfolio and you carry on investing it. And six months later, you get 32 rand. And down the line, it starts to add up. And eventually, you get to the point where the dividends are like an avalanche. It's just free money rushing at you so fast you can't catch it. <laughs> Warning. That's going to happen in 2050, eh? <laughs> costs. I'm going to talk about costs. Because you know what? There are two truths in the world. One there are no free lunches. Actually, there are. I had a sandwich a moment ago and it was free. <coughs> but you're going to have to pay. You're going to have to pay to transact. And you're going to pay a, a, a probably an admin fee at your stockbroker for all of the back information that they give you, the education, the research reports, the access to information and data, and the like. So we have to pay. But we don't have to buy them a Ferrari. No, no, sorry, dude. <laughs> no Ferraris today. The point is, you understand the power of compound interest, right? That idea that interest earned on interest on interest and how powerful that becomes and how significant it becomes. Costs are, well, they're a compound cost. What they do is they eat away, every, you know, they're constantly eating and eating at your money and making it go smaller and smaller. So we've got to be massively cost aware. And it, to a degree, it's around issues such as transaction fees, it's around monthly admin fees and the like. But it's also subscription services we can sign up for. You know, it, it, do we really need, I mean, the, the, the range of things. Do we really need to subscribe to three different newspapers, four magazines and seven TV channels to make us a better investor? Not if it's costing us thousands of rands. That's money that could be better deployed into the investing process. Now you can go and buy fancy, expensive charting software. 
for 16,000 Rand, or you can use the free software your broker provides for, well, zero Rand. The difference, 16,000. And they're gonna tell you the 16,000 Rand software is better? Well then, I mean, then if it's so good, why is someone selling it to me? Why aren't they so rich that they're on a yacht in the Bahamas? <coughs> so we've got to pay fees, but we've got to be ruthless with our fees. We've got to constantly be engaging. We've got to, you know, and, and I say to folks, and the brokers hate me for this, and Sean, close your ears. I'm going to say to you right now, once a month, phone your broker and ask for a discount. You know what? They're going to say no every time. But one time, they might just get tired of you and say, what, you know what? If you promise not to phone next month, I'll give you a discount. <laughs> Why not? Phone them on your free minutes so it doesn't cost you any money. <laughs> Problem sorted. Nothing asked, nothing gained. Okay, I'm going to move to this because the man flashed a timey thing at me, telling me my time is running. So let's look at a portfolio. A portfolio, and we can step way back, but I'm looking here at an equity portfolio. Broader than that, and just for disclaimer reasons, um, I own every one of the shares on that screen. Yes, I do. And I use most of them too. Because if you're going to own them, use them. Hey, be a client. Make some money for them. Unless, of course, I mean, if you happen to bank with the worst bank in the world, well, don't go and invest in it. You know it's the worst bank. It's going to not do anything. Looking at an equity portfolio, what do you want within it? The first mistake a lot of people make, or some people make, is simply too many shares. They go and put 60 shares in a portfolio. No, sorry, I mean, 60 shares, you, you, you need to make a decision. You want to buy the winners, you want to buy the best. They're not 60. The other mistake they make is they go put one share. And they go find the biggest loser they possibly can. You know, they go find a gold mine that hasn't mined gold since the 1800s. And they say, yeah, but you know what, if they ever do find gold, <laughs> and if they manage to get it out of the ground, and if the gold price is $5,000, they're going to make a buck of profit. Nonsense. Forget them. Yeah. So you want to diversify. You want to diversify across different sectors. What you notice here is two things. Firstly, a theme. And I'll touch on the theme in a moment. But what you see here is I've got uh, banking. I've got uh, retail. I've got telecoms. Uh, I've got uh, mining resources. You want to be across different sectors. You don't want to put everything into banking. You want some banking. You want some retail. You want other bits and pieces in the different spaces. The theme to me, investing is first of all, what is big picture, multi-decade, 50-year theme? And to me, the theme is simple. Urbanization. People moving to cities. The implication of people moving to cities? People getting richer. I don't mean rich. I just mean richer. No, think about it. I, I, I come from rural KZN. In rural KZN, you know, you live on a farm, you can live on a small amount of cash. You move to the city, you, you make an extra 50 bucks a month. It's only 50 rand, but where does that 50 rand go? Into the economy. It's being spent. And we're seeing people in China, 350 million people who used to live in rural areas now live in cities. And there's another 700 million Chinese still in the rural areas. We're seeing it in South Africa. We absolutely are. The cities are growing fast. The rural areas, you drive through the rural Eastern Cape, Kwazulu Natal, the rural areas are not growing. They are, they are shrinking. Consumerization. Consumerization leads to a couple of things. It leads to, well, people are in the city. So what are they doing? Well, hey, they're suddenly exposed to ShopRite and Woolies, which you certainly don't get in Kwandagezi KZN. They suddenly got bank accounts and salaries and they on MTN, okay, and you see MTN everywhere, even in Kwandagezi. <laughs> but we start to see more from that. What are we seeing? People are moving to cities. What do they have access to? Better health care. People are living longer. Implications of living longer? Well, it means they're going to have, hopefully, more retirement money. But so to me, the big theme is around the consumer, the growing consumer base out there, urbanization. And that's my core investment theme. In my portfolio, I do a two-prong approach. I have what I call my core portfolio and then my satellite. My core is exchange-traded funds, ETS. Mike Brown will be talking about exchange-traded products later, things such as Satrix, things such as the better beta equal weighted 40. And those are just basket of shares. So that just gives me 
the market performance. Market goes up 20% last year, that big green ball in the middle goes up 20% as well. And that's the easy investing. And when Mike Brown speaks later, if the only person you listen to today is Mike Brown, you are winning. <laughs> no, exchange traded funds, best thing ever. And you put them in the core of your portfolio. And to my advice, a minimum of 50% goes into exchange traded funds. And if you want to put 100% in there, that's fine as well. Warren Buffett, third richest man in the world. When he dies, what is he doing with the money he leaves his wife? He's putting it in an ETF. When private investors say to Warren Buffett, Mr. Buffett, what should I do with my money? He says, buy an ETF. It's the simple, easy way of wealth creation. Whether you do it as an individual, whether you do it as a club, whether you do it in a stock fund, ETFs over time, and it's always about time, ETFs over time create wealth. My niece and nephew, I buy them, I don't buy them presents, I buy them exchange traded funds. Every birthday, Christmas, etc., etc., I buy them ETFs. <coughs> they still think it's quite exciting. At one point, they're going to realize. Rah, rah. But then the question is, when do I give them the ETFs? So I could give it to them when they're 20. You know what? It would be a nice pot of cash for them. And not so much because I've picked the best ETF, which of course I think I have, but, but because it's 20 years. But then I start to run the math. And I realize if I give it to them when they're 20, what are they going to do with the money? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> hey, we were all 20 once. So I can't give it to them when they're 20. I'll give it to them when they're 30. Because it'll be even a bigger pile of money. You know what'll happen? Someone will take my advice and marry them for their money. <laughs> okay, so they can't get it when they're 30 either. So I give it to them when they're 40. And they're going to take Sean's advice and buy a Ferrari, midlife crisis. <laughs> so they can't get it when they're 40. They're going to get it when they're 50. They'll hate me. I'll be dead. <laughs> the point is, at 50 years old, it is, going to be a, it is going to be a giant amount of money that if they manage right, met that half of the family, I don't have kids, so it's my sister's kids. That will be a family that for the next forever generations never have to work again. Until, of course, one of the generations drinks it away. <laughs> uh, we've all seen the movie about that. And the secret? Time. Just time. Of course, I'll have to break it to them if they get it when they're 50. So you then go and put the, the exchange-traded funds in the middle. And then you go and find some satellite stocks. The stocks that you say are going to be the winners over the long term. And I'd look for a couple of things. I like to, the phrase I like to use, and I stole it from Gelo Giosi from First Avenue Investment Managers. The phrase is irreplaceable and impenetrable. Impenetrable, they have got a moat that you can't cross. Woolies moat? Woolies moat is quite simple. Status. And quality. I mean, you pay for the quality, but it's there. ShopRite's moat, location, price. Can pick and pay fight on price? They can. Are they likely to win? And if we delve into the numbers, and every one rand that ShopRite makes, six cents is profit. Of every one rand that goes through pick and pays till, one cent is profit. So when they start fighting, ShopRite's got a lot more ammo than pick and pay. And it's like, you know, you, you pick the oak with the ammo, right? In this case, the ammo is rands and cents, and you pick them. Sassel's moat, technology, intellectual property. They take oil and gas and turn it into, uh, coal and gas, and turn it into oil, the most valuable commodity in the world. You go to Mpumalanga, you scratch the ground, you find coal. And in parts of Mpumalanga, you don't even scratch the ground, you just look down, you find coal. <laughs> they take that stuff that's plentiful and they turn it into oil, the most valuable commodity in the world. So you go and find a few winners, and you go and place those winners around your portfolio. You do it selectively, and most importantly, you buy when the price is right. Because it might be a brilliant company, but is it a good price? And the answer is, at the moment, there's not a lot that's a good price. There are some. I mean, in recent times, on that chart there, I've been buying both Sasso and MTN because they meet my requirement for what I consider quality at a good price. That's my beeper. Ah, it's telling me my time is done. <coughs> so
So you start with those ETFs. You put them in the core, you put them in the middle. You focus on the ETFs, they're the easy part. And then you start to think and you ponder and you meet and you start to decide which are the companies that are irreplaceable, impenetrable, and that you want to buy. You identify those companies and then you start saying, what price do we want to pay for them? And then you wait. And you might wait a long time for a company you like to be at a price you like. But the point is, investing's about time. You've got it. You've got it in decades. You've got bucket fulls of time. So you wait and you give it that time for, to buy it. The one thing we can control in the market, the price we pay. Be stingy with the price that you pay. It's your money. It's hard-earned. Be stingy with it.